chapter 8, uh, the Equip the Council materials, uh, titled General Biblical Counseling Methods. And, and really what we'll begin to look at at this time is, is the methods of counseling that tend to apply to all counselors and counselees across most situations and most times, just the general things you'll find yourself needing to do and to be as a biblical counselor under most uh, circumstances. You'll recall uh, we're in the, the foundations of biblical counseling section where we're just building a house of biblical counsel where we began with just placing biblical counseling as an aspect of biblical discipleship as an aspect of uh, gospel ministry, of ministering the Word of God to the hearts of people. We laid four pillars, uh, rooted in God, exalts in Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and loving. And it's just the, the four pillars of biblical counseling that make up what is biblical counseling. We laid seven foundation stones of just the essential truths of biblical counseling, the, the creed uh, that we herald, that we declare, uh, as biblical counselors. And then we uh, took some time and looked at what biblical counseling aims to produce in people, just the fruit of biblical counseling, of salvation, of sanctification, of spiritual fruit. And in the last three chapters, we, we looked at who are the primary figures of biblical counseling, at man uh, and the gospel, at man and biblical counseling, and before those, at God and his word. And just beginning to define biblically who are these persons and these figures that are going to be involved in, in the work of counseling ministry and ministering the word uh, to daily life. And so that brings us uh, at, at this time to, to this eighth chapter and namely beginning to talk about just the, the methods of biblical counseling. Um, we've laid the important pieces and foundation stones there. And now how do we answer this question? What does biblical counseling do generally. Uh, in the next chapter, we'll ask the question, what does biblical counseling do specifically? But in this one, we'll, we'll talk more about what biblical counseling does uh, generally. If you think about, again, the illustration of farming or, or planting a vineyard and growing grapes, there's certain methods of farming that, that apply across all places, all kinds of crops, all farmers, all landscapes, there's certain things that if you're going to grow something from the earth that, that you have to do no matter where you're at or what you're doing, you have to till soil, you have to uncover the dirt, you have to plant seed, you have to water, yeah, sometimes you have to provide some kinds of fertilizer or feeding, but those sorts of methods of tilling, of planting, of watering, of harvesting, those are just methods of farming that apply across all manner of situations um, and types of crops and types of um, landscape that we may bear those crops on. The things that we'll just always be doing uh, is biblical counselors. And so in this chapter, we're going to talk about four in particular, just the four general methods of biblical counseling that, that you will find yourself hopefully having to call upon and do constantly. Uh, as you counsel the word under all sorts of, of circumstances. So that'll be one of our first objectives for, for today is to lay those four out. A second objective will be to talk about uh, just an initial counseling meeting with someone. What would be five just general goals or objectives of an initial meeting with someone that you're beginning to counsel and minister the word to them? And then a third objective will be to talk about six uh, situations that you may face as you counsel the word um, that really you need to enlist some structured help that, that just counseling with them even biblically scripturally um, will not be enough uh, of a structure of a system in place to take care of the issues that you're facing and so we'll uh, take some time and just talk through what some of those situations um, may be so let me pray for us and then we'll begin to dig in Father, for this day we give you great praise, great glory, great honor. Lord, for all that are listening at this time, all that are learning, all that are present, even now, and wherever place they may be, I just pray for them and thank you for them and asking that you would, even now, open their hearts and their eyes and ears to, to your word and your truth, that your spirit would 
humble them, would prepare them to uh, learn and to grow in respect to their salvation and the ministry of the word. Lord, from my own heart and mouth, I just pray for your spirit strengthening, for your spirit's counsel, for you to grant wisdom and, and guidance. For Lord, I am but a man and a weak man and a feeble man. And so I'm desperately in need of your grace to represent your word truthfully, to deal with so massive a, a topic of counseling uh, in a way that Lord, gives you glory and honor and credit and does justice to the ministry of your word. So help us this day, help us this moment uh, to grow in your likeness, to live lives that are pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this chapter bears its title because we're going to speak about and look at the methods of biblical counseling that generally to apply to all counselors and all counselees at almost all times. Um, it, it will describe the general attitudes and actions of the biblical counselor, your general attitudes and actions that should sort of thread through week in, week out, hour in, hour out of your counseling ministry. Um, that, that we'll find ourselves just having to engage in constantly. Due to the nature and goal of this material, each, really each biblical counselor, each of you are free to develop your style, your manner within these guidelines uh, based on your own spiritual gifting, your own level of discernment, experience, spiritual maturity, that none of us, no two of us will get into a room with someone and counsel them exactly the same way. Uh, by God's grace and to his glory, there's just so much diversity. There's so much room for, for the spirit to work in each of us differently. But what we'll look at is what are the, the four things that should apply almost always across most of us, most times. The, the, the general methods of biblical counseling that aren't so much spiritual gifting or circumstantially driven, but really uh, just part of the nature of what counsel is. And so these things will always belong there. This chapter will be a building block for the next, namely the, the next chapter we'll talk about the specific biblical counseling methods, the specific, specific things that we will do and be with people depending on the situations they're bringing to our attention, their heart and where they're at and their level of maturity, but then also where we're at. And so this week will be an important one, or this, this chapter rather an important one to building into the next. So the general methods of biblical counseling, this is this first section. Um, I think it's important to begin with understanding and picking up from last week when we talked about why do people seek counsel generally? And the reason is suffering. People seek counsel because they're suffering or they're anticipating suffering and they want help in that suffering. And the sources of, the, of that suffering is diverse. The condition of people's hearts in the midst of that suffering is diverse. But nonetheless, it's pain typically or the anticipation of pain that will bring people to seek your help and your counsel in a time of need. And I think it's important that we begin there so that as we begin our counseling walk with someone, um, we begin in love. And that's going to be this first general method one. It's just to love as Christ would love. Um, we'll never be done with that method. There'll never be a situation where this method doesn't apply. But it's, more, it's where we begin, it's the middle, it's the end of our counseling ministry, is to love as Christ would love. And I'll walk through here just, I think, five ways that we can communicate and show that love to people. And the first is that we desire to help. That in numerous situations described by the Scripture, God communicates His desire for our good, His desire to help us, His desire to be with us. And there's something about that by itself that is loving and comforting and and brings peace, I think, to us. So in the same way, we follow in his likeness and follow his manner of counsel by beginning in love, by just desiring to help people, having a heart of interest in seeing others prosper and do well and flourish and grow. It says Exodus 3.12, and he said, Certainly, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God 
put this mound in here. Again, in Joshua 1 5, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I have been with Moses. I will be with you. I will not forsake you. I will not fail you. This is God's people of God. This is the 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 people aspect of love for granted. When we think about the business of our lives, when we think about the moments where someone may call you at home, uh, may call you in the middle of something, may call upon you to sit down with them and counsel them after a uh, church service, uh, and all of these things that you'll have on your mind are distracted by the preachers of them. You have to pray for the Lord Jesus with a desire to help you. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, as God, as Jesus commissions the disciples to make disciples of all nations, to teach all that he's commanded, he leaves them with a promise, and lo, I am with you, even to the end of the age. Lo, I'm going to, I'm going to help you. I'm sending a helper, the Spirit, to be with you. And if there's something in that that is so comforting, such a pure expression of love, it's just that desire to help Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. That's Romans 15, 7. We're to receive one another. We're to desire the good of others, fellowship with others, to help others. So this begins with being present. Secondly, being attentive, asking sensitive questions, and then being concerned with the interests of those that you counsel. That, that we just learn to be present with them, that we learn to listen closely to them and make ourselves available to them and be present with them. Especially living in an age that has become so electronic, so internet-driven, so media-driven, where we can have the illusion of, of connecting and interacting and being present with people and in their lives when we're, we're not. We may be reading their email or listening to their message or wherever we're at on their account on the internet, thinking that we're with them, thinking they're with us, when really our minds and our hearts are in a hundred different places and distracted by so many things. So learning to be with people face to face, human to human, um, is so vital to communicating this love. But then secondly, offer your full attention, which is, again, an outworking of the previous desire to help, be present, be there, but then offer your full attention. As God offers us his full attention, that everyone has a story to tell, and some people's stories are easier to listen to than others. Some people will come and speak to you about the, the horrific abuse they've endured in their life. Others will come and speak to you of, of the abuse they perpetrated on others. Some will come to you in great pain of marriage and pain that they've endured. Others, pain they are causing. Some things that you have no ability to remove or fix or take from them. But you can offer your full attention as the Lord does. Because in every situation, to every prayer, to every moment of need, the Lord hears. And this is part of his comfort and love for us is that he listens and he hears us. Exodus 22, 23. If you afflict him at all, and if he does cry out to me, I will surely hear his cry. But if there's someone that in that nation of Israel that is being afflicted in whatever capacity maybe, but especially as a slave or as a, 
um, in some role that can be of powerlessness that we take advantage of, he can cry out and, they, and God hears him. God listens to him. First Kings 8.30, listen to the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel. When they pray toward this place, here in heaven, your dwelling place, hear and forgive. There's part of the prayer here out to God that, Lord, listen to us as we pray, as we talk to you, hear us. James 1.19, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And that's namely in response to the Word of God, namely in response to the revelation of God that James is talking about in James 1, but then also just in life as a whole, and just in relationship to God and one another. Let us be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Psalm 65, 2, O you who hear prayer, to you all men, Come. It's a declaration to God about God. To you, men can come because you hear, you listen. So a few examples are uh, when someone speaks and shares that you maybe retract or rephrase their statements so that you make sure you hear them well. We, 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 when someone shares, this is what is going on or this is what has happened to me or this is how I'm feeling or what I'm thinking, that we learn to rephrase and, and share back with, okay, this is what I'm hearing you describe to me, or this is the sense or the impression I'm getting from you. Is that correct? Where we labor and we work to offer our, our full attention and make sure we hear. We refrain from premature conclusions. We, we don't jump to that after 20 minutes of listening to someone, we don't assume we, 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 we got their whole life figured out, but that we have to continue to offer our attention and to listen. We maintain just an open and a warm body posture. That when someone's speaking to us, we're not staring off into space um, and thinking about other things or staring off into space and or playing with our phone or playing with gadgets or just wandering to and fro, um, disconnected, um, closed down, shut down, we're not just sit there scrunched up and with a scowl and arms crossed and like we're just unhappy to be there, but that, that there's a warmness in our posture, a warmness in our face, an openness to the way we present ourselves with those who are in our care. And if that's an area of struggle for us, then we, we ask people to help us, you know, help me uh, communicate to others uh, openness and kindness and receptivity to them. And then we listen just attentively and accurately. I think there's nothing more frustrating to those who seek counsel and pour things out to us than and the feeling that we're not listening, that we don't really hear them, or that we're not trying. Um, so they have to keep repeating themselves or going back over things because we're not really hearing or listening to what they say. Um, and so being sure to, to pay attention. Again, don't take this for granted. I can tell you there, are, there will be days where I walk into my counseling study and I'll sit with people and I'm exhausted and and. There's things going at home and on at home and in life and in ministry that are burdensome and difficult and painful. Whole worlds of things that are on my heart and mind. I have to pray that the Lord make me attentive because it's at those moments when it's the most difficult. And the easiest thing is just to shut down and become robotic. And so don't take this for granted, even in yourself. Uh, so it'll be something you always have to pray for and prepare for. The third aspect of loving as Christ would love would be to labor to understand that we work hard to, to understand people, to get a sense of not just what they're saying, but who they are behind it and really understand what they mean by what they say. That for specific reasons, God has found it necessary to express his ability to sympathize with us, to empathize with our situation and struggle. The whole incarnation Jesus becoming a man is an expression of this love for us, that, to, that he would be a sympathetic savior, a sympathetic high priest, that we do not worship a God who cannot empathize with our struggles, who cannot say to us, in our pain, I know pain, who cannot say to us in our moment of agony, I, I hear you, I, and I understand where you're coming from in that agony, that when tempted, he too has been tempted, 
And that's one of the reasons why the author of Hebrews says to cry out to him. Hebrews 12, 3. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. And again in Hebrews 2, 18. For since he himself was tempted in all that he has suffered, he's able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. And then in Hebrews 4, 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. So we're to encourage counselors to really help us understand what life is like in their shoes. What is it like to be you? What is it like to be married to them, to be a parent to them, to be a child of in this family, to be a part of this church, to be in your body, to deal with your body each day, to deal with your particular struggles of sin and despair or anxiety, what your their pride looks like when it rears up, just what it's like to go day to day in their workplace, in their shoes, and that we're laboring to understand, to see the world a little bit through their eyes. But then also it means we're willing to ask, what do you mean by that? That I believe one of the most critical questions uh, in biblical counseling is the question, what do you mean by that? Help me understand what you mean by your words. Because someone will come in and say, you know, I, I'm depressed or I'm anxious. Or, and we'll assume we know what they mean by those words. Um, but we don't because we all have certain images, certain ideas, certain vocabulary in mind. And, and we have certain things in mind when we use those words. But it may not be the same idea they have in mind, the same life experience they have in mind. And so we ask, okay, you said depression. Help me understand what you mean by that word. Like you said bipolar disorder. Help me understand what you mean by that word. Describe that for me. What does that look like in your life? You said that you're feeling pain and just in your body and chronic back pain and sleeping trouble. And just paint that picture for me. What do you mean by that? When you say your child throws temper tantrums, um, every parent has a different definition of what a tantrum is. So we have to ask, okay, what do you mean by that? Explain that to me. Help me understand. So really learning to use that question, um, what do you mean by that? And, and, and help me understand what it's like for you. Sometimes I think it's important to really share potential commonalities with all believers. That no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. But God is faithful. He won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when tempted, he will provide a, provide a way out for you so that you may grow up or stand up under it. And just that comforting message that all of us fundamentally endure the same kinds of temptation. Our particular flavors, our particular details of our sin struggles, our temptation may be different. But at the very core, in the very middle, we struggle in the same ways and for the same reasons. And so in every situation and everyone that comes into you, there'll be ways in which you can communicate, you know, this is part of the Christian life. This is part of the human struggle. This is part of what it means to be in relationship with God or others or to be out of relationship with God or others. That we are able to connect those dots so that they see and hear that, we not only understand them, but that we're able to see how their struggle and particular difficulties relate to the human struggle and to the Christian struggle and to others and to call similarities and commonalities there. A fourth part of loving as Christ would love is to exercise compassion. Just that we would learn to weep with those who weep, to rejoice with those who rejoice, that like Christ, we have an opportunity to express compassion for, interest in, um, in, in the struggles, the joys, the pains, the delights uh, of other humans, of other people, and in, in what it's like to, to live in their world. And there's something in that that's comforting. There's something in that that's part of the character of God to exercise and to show compassion. Uh, because our God is a God of compassion. He cares about his creation. He cares about his people. His heart breaks and grieves with us in our times of grief, yet also in our times of great evil and rebellion and sin. That we can grieve the Holy Spirit 
And we couldn't grieve the Holy Spirit if he didn't care, if he did not have compassion on us. And so Psalm 27.10 is an expression of hope, it's reality. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Such a vital verse I find for, for people who have had difficult, painful upbringings, for men and women who have come from homes that were abusive, fathers and mothers that were not kind or they were proud, they were selfish, um, whatever those things may be, to realize that this is a comfort. My father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. And ultimately, every human being in all the earth, my own children included, will someday be able to say that about me and mean it, that my father is forsaken me, my mother's forsaken me, but the Lord, the Lord will take me up. And, and part of parenting, I believe, is, is helping our children pray that prayer where they realize we're not the Lord, we're not God, but that He is perfect in His love for them. He has compassion on them. And that that's what really matters. That's what we feast on. Romans 15, 2 through 3, each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. And that's a great act of compassion from Jesus that when he came to earth, when he lived his life, it was not to feed himself. And, and use people for his own uh, personal fleshly benefit. But he had compassion on us, love for us, came to please and serve and edify us in a very eternal sense. Often it was said of Jesus that he looked upon the people, the people who were suffering, who were misguided, who were ignorant, and said that he had compassion on them. And he would have compassion on them, and he would sit down and he would teach them. He had compassion on them, and he would sit down, and he would feed them. He would have compassion on, on them, and he would sit, and he would heal them. That Jesus, it was one of his instinctive responses and emotional responses and affections to people, which is a, a compassion for them. 1 Corinthians 12, 23 through 25, And those members of the body, which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundance. And our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. That we're to have that, a care for one another, that when we look at the way that God has composed the church and composed the body, we're all different. We've all got our different unique uh, gifts, our unique struggles and sins and temptations, but that we're there to encourage and to edify one another, to have compassion on one another. And not to just get bitter and angry because they don't do things the way we want them to do them. They don't do things the way we do things. They don't feel the way we feel. They don't think just the way we think. And so we become bitter or insensitive or frustrated or impatient. Rather than having compassion, that we really are all different. We really are at different places in the Christian life. He really has given to all of us a different measure of faith. So if there's to be unity in the body, unity in biblical counseling, then there has to be the exercise and the expression and the communication of compassion and appreciation for where everybody's at. First Peter 5-7 Casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. That's why we're able to cast our anxiety upon Christ, upon the Lord. For us. And we should be the same with others by sacrificing our time and energy, by maintaining a tender attitude, by not being legalistic and judgmental and critical to those who suffer and are in pain, who fall short, to express empathy for their struggles or suffering. And sometimes this may mean that you truly and legitimately cry with people as you hear their stories. And I don't mean fabricate it or fake it, but that your heart be so softened to people and compassionate toward people that as you hear their story, as you receive them and their pain, that there will be times where you're moved 
to tears. Other times you'll be moved to anger and to um, holy anger when you hear certain stories. And that, that's part of being compassionate too, on the oppressed, on the afflicted, on those who have been mistreated. So part of the reason that, that, that God expresses wrath upon evildoers and on wrongdoers is because of just his compassion for the unprotected, his compassion for those who are being mistreated and oppressed and beaten down. And so our God is a God of compassion, and, and, and we should be also. Fifthly, we uphold the truth. That that's another aspect of loving as Christ would love, is that we uphold the truth. While Christ desires to help, attend, understanding, show compassion when his people suffer, he offers these things according to the truth. Ephesians 4, 15, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, and that is Christ, even Christ. If there's a, a great phrase that captures biblical counseling, it's this one, speaking the truth in love. So we love people, but as far as that love, we speak truth, we uphold truth. And so in no way as we counsel others are we to neglect the truth or contradict the truth or avoid the truth in order to make people feel better or less guilty or less ashamed. That the, the couple coming in ashamed of an abortion that they paid for and went about and followed through with, it does not... It, it, it is of no love to them for us to say, oh, don't worry, it's not that big a deal. Many people do it. That is not loving. That is not upholding of the truth. But it's a horrific act. It's a horrific sin. But as we put that next to the grace of Christ, the, the gospel and the glory of Jesus who forgives even the most atrocious sins, that is where the comfort lies. Not in minimizing uh, or rejecting or neglecting the truth. Because that man or woman comes in um, desiring to dis divorce their spouse because marriage is just too hard or too painful. And it's ever so tempting to want to appease them and say, oh yes, you have grounds, go do it. That, that we realize that isn't loving of them. That isn't good for them. So upholding the truth is we uphold what God teaches us about marriage and divorce and, and remarriage. And then our love for them, we uphold the truth. So we speak truly and often of Jesus, his grace, the forgiveness of sins, his redeeming work. And we uphold the truth and we speak the truth in love, even when it isn't comfortable, even when it isn't desired, even when those who are receiving it don't want it or like it. As a biblical counselor, you stick to it. So love as Christ would love. That's general method one, and we're never really done with it. It should weave through all of our counsel all the time that we really desire to help, that we really learn to be attentive and present and listen, that we learn to, to have compassion and show compassion, express compassion, that we listen well and warmly and graciously, that we uphold the truth as we go, that, that we love as Christ would love. And the best lesson in this is just study Jesus, study his way with people, study God's way with people, study the way... He shows his love to, to people. And the general method, too, is discern. Namely, discern the problem as Christ would discern. That many counseling endeavors fail because they've ever truly begun, because the problems being addressed, the counseling objectives, have been construed in worldly or human terms. That perhaps the person seeking your counsel says they have a chemical imbalance. Or perhaps they say that I have a mood disorder or a, a life transition problem or I have a spouse problem, that my spouse is the affliction. I have a sexual addiction. Um, whatever the vocabulary and the words may be, that if these constructs, if these words and, and terms and vocabulary stand as the definition of the problem, then the creators of those constructs, all the books that talk about all those constructs and those who are experienced in treating those exact particular constructs will be the ones that, that, that are sought for the healing of those maladies. So as long as we take those terms and, and, and those issues that are brought to us at face value and don't learn to dig beneath them, then 
then we'll get misguided before we've ever begun. We'll never be on the right foot to discerning as Christ would discern. And moreover, if the primary counseling objective is to find relief from those presumed troubles, then the very methods that will be sought and applied in dealing with that bipolar disorder, in dealing with that major depressive disorder, in dealing with that life transition problem, or that chemical imbalance, or whatever it may be, will be sought and applied that give the recipient of counsel the impression of relief, that our goals will very quickly be to improve, by experience at least, the temporary trajectory of someone's life, to improve in the, in the immediate sense symptoms, just to take away symptoms. In this narrow approach, um, counseling will just become a place for the resolution of circumstances because we've simply received uh, the counselee's definition of this is what the problem is or the world's definition of this is what the problem is and not gotten beneath it and behind it and into the scriptures of how does the Lord define that problem. Because every now and then circumstances will indeed improve. And that is certainly nice. I think we ought to rejoice when people are able to find jobs that are good jobs and, and be in environments or, or their bodies be healed in ways that there's relief and there's more environmental peace. I think we ought to be thankful for that. I just don't think we ought to call that an improvement in the human estate, a true lasting change uh, that will, will go into eternity to the glory and the praise of God. It may be the expression of such a change, but the symptom change itself, just the mere adjusting of circumstances, is not really what the Lord is after from us in biblical counsel. If a person is alienated from Christ or living in rebellion, then it's perhaps the case that they need to feel worse, not better. If someone's heart condition is filled with pride and self-absorption, if they avoid Jesus, if we're not in the scriptures and not in prayer, if we're forsaking the assembly of believers, if we're hard-hearted in response to correction, then we need to feel better. We need to feel worse. There needs to be grief and sorrow and pain that comes, not the alleviation of circumstances. And so those are the, be the things that we look at in this section on, or section B of just discernment as Christ to discern the problem. So that, number one, we learn to see and construe human life and counseling in biblical ways. Number two, the methods and the things we go to to help people change are those given to us by God. So this discernment begins, number one, with starting with their definition of the problem or pain. The man, the woman, the child, the family, the couple that's coming to you for counsel, they will have a certain definition of their problem or their pain the reason they're coming to you for help. And I think we have to start with that. We have to start with helping them tell their story, taking the words they give us and listening and understanding. So maybe depression, anxiety, spousal mistreatment, job loss, stress, anger, child rearing frustration, divorce, alcohol abuse, academic duress, legal binds, past domestic violence or abuse. Still, still ready? Maybe divorce, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, academic stresses and duresses, legal problems, legal binds, a prison sentence. Um, they may construe it as a lack of faith, as spiritual maturity. Sometimes you'll have folks that come in and say, you know, my problem is in my heart. And I'm filled with pride or I'm filled with selfishness or hate or bitterness. Sometimes they'll come in identifying it right out of the gate as something like that. Death of a family member, death of a child, a father, a mother, um, some strain or agony or piece of suffering at work, joblessness and, and financial strains and problems. It could be any number of things that the person that's coming to you for counsel is saying this is what ails me, this is what my problem is. So we have to listen and begin there. And then gently help them, the counselee, examine the source of their problem or pain in the light of Scripture. And this goes back to what we looked at in the last chapter a lot, where we begin to help them examine 
the sources of their suffering in life, where we begin to look at, okay, the condition of the heart, where we begin to look at the relational circumstances of their life, and where is the pain coming from there, whether through human beings they're in relationship with, whether it's demonic pressures, or, or whether it's the relationship with the Lord, whatever that may be. We look at their physical circumstances, their biological, that if there's medical agonies and struggles and suffering, their body is just wearing down on them. Whatever it may be, we help them examine their heart. We help them examine their relational circumstances. We help them examine their natural circumstances. And just like we looked at in that last chapter, begin to write down and help them write down where's the suffering coming from? What are the sources of it in your life? And then thirdly, we gently and over time help them examine how their heart is thinking and feeling and acting in response to their problem or pain, how they are thinking and acting and living, and why they are thinking and acting and living that way. What's really ruling their heart? We ask, whose kingdom are they living for? Who is their God? Who is their Savior? Who do they worship? Whose glory do they long for? Who captures their attention? Who do they think about more than anyone else? Where and what is their treasure? In what ways is the spirit and their flesh battling inside them in the midst of this problem or pain, in the midst of their suffering? What's that exposing about them? What's it exposing about that hidden war in the soul between their flesh and the spirit of God? What do they believe Christ is trying to produce in them and through them by this trial, by this pain, by this suffering? That step three of discerning as Christ would discern is helping them um, see what's going on in their heart and their thoughts and actions and relationships in the midst of this problem and pain and suffering. What is the Lord teaching them about who they worship, about where they go for comfort? about what they prize, about what they treasure, about where they really bank their hopes, about what they pray for, and if they pray at all, about in their life and in their ministry, who they really serve and think about, and why, and what motivations are driving them. Then fourth, in discerning the problem as Christ would discern, we we then help them restate their problem. We help the one seeking counsel from us to restate their problem in the light of the scriptures, in the light of what the, the Lord has to say about them. That we take the words they began with, which may have been depression or anxiety or spousal mistreatment or financial pains and agonies or um, child rearing troubles, and you say, okay, is that how the Lord is seeing it? Is that the source of your pain and suffering, perhaps? But is that really the source of your despair? Is that really the source of your anxiety? Is that really the reason you're thinking, acting, living the way you are? Again, as we looked at in that last chapter, we have to tease those apart for people as we counsel them. We have to uh, begin for their understanding to separate the source of their suffering from the source of why they are the way they are and why they're thinking and feeling and acting the way they are and that they overlap they're interwoven but for them to begin to see how the, what rules their heart rules their life so that they can redefine uh, the issue and their problem and pain in the light of scripture which now may be unrepentance now it may be trusting in myself rather than the lord it may be that i don't really believe in the sovereignty and in the goodness of God, and that's why I'm so anxious. It may be that I love money, and that's why I'm depressed and despairing. It may be that I love for people to like me and to praise me and to approve of me, and I'm being criticized and mistreated all over the place, and my heart can't handle that, and so I'm rageful and bitter and resentful and depressed. You'll never know uh, what road that will take those you counsel down. But it, ultimately, you'll have to help them redefine their struggle in the light of Scripture. And then over time, help them, the counselees, see their problem as it relates to the affections of their heart. Learning to see their life 
as it relates to the affections of their heart. And if that's the thing the Lord is after, and that's the thing that uh, we're called to submit to him, and that if we love him above all else, if our affections are for him and his kingdom and his glory, if our treasure is truly in heaven, if our treasure is truly Jesus, if he has our affections, then everything else will come. Everything else will follow. That is self-exaltation and self-pity. Rather than seeing those as the product of an environment, to see those as a product of pride and ruling the human heart, of great affection for self. In everything I see, everything around me, I see as an opportunity to feed myself, to support and strengthen my kingdom come, my will be done. And that now I love stuff. I love money. I love my way. I love the things of the world rather than the God who made it and the people that he has filled it with. And so helping people see and take those words and those struggles and over time see the affections of their heart and what really rules them. To see contentment and peace amidst storm, that these are the expressions of Christ ruling the heart, affection for Christ and his kingdom, that contentment, joy, peace, hope, love, faith working itself through love, that those are the expressions of a heart that is deeply affectionate for Christ. And so learning to, to get there and, and help counselees see themselves in that light, that they are what they love, and that their lives follow the affections and the passions of their hearts. Now, for any given situation, those five steps I just walked through could take 15 minutes. It could take 15 hours. Uh, it could take 15 days. Depending on the particular situation you're facing, the particular counselee that you're counseling with, your own heart and preparedness to, to go in that direction, um, that you never know what kind of time it will take to walk through those steps. But if you're dealing with someone who's proud or self-righteous, hard-hearted, then you may get through step one, maybe into step two, and and have a lot of trouble getting through those remaining steps because that person has no interest in seeing the problem as anything other than someone else or seeing the issues of their life and their heart as anything other than uh, the condition of their physiological state. Uh, and so depending on the spiritual maturity, the soft hardness, the humility of the person you're dealing with, um, that could be very hard and slow. But then also dealing on just the condition of your heart. Sometimes if we're impatient, if we're uh, not loving, not tender, if, if we get ahead of ourselves, then we could jump through those steps way too quickly. And we could go from one to five and leave the person we're counseling and serving somewhere behind in, in the dust. And so there's a real art form you'll have to develop with time and with practice for how you maneuver through that discern the problem as Christ would discern it stage um, in a way that fits the, the person you're interacting with, fits the situation. But there's just no way for me to tell you this is exactly how you do it. Um, because there'll be part of that that just will be the spirit and you and that person walking the road as it comes. The third general method, section C there, is that we identify biblical solutions. We love as Christ would love. We discern as Christ would discern. And then thirdly, we identify biblical solutions. That from my perspective, the goal of biblical counseling is not to fix things and prescribe proven to work remedies, proven to work formula, take away the counselee's pain and suffering, you know, or their money back. That I don't believe the word fix is a word that belongs in the vocabulary of a biblical counselor. Um, it seems quite evident in the scriptures that the Lord is not primarily interested in taking away all pain and suffering right now. The Lord is not primarily interested in alleviating hardship or changing all of our circumstances so that we don't need help. Working all things according to his counsel and glory, working all things for the furtherance of his kingdom, for the spread of the gospel, for the redemption of people, that is his purpose. That is his desire. And from time to time, that means the alleviation of pain and circumstances. 
but at other times it does not. So part of this identifying biblical solutions means that we learn what it means uh, to work all things according to good for those who love God, meaning God working all things for good to those who love God, God redeeming and bringing about all things in his time and for his glory. So a key to identifying biblical solutions then is to help those we counsel, to help counselees walk wisely, walk faithfully, walk humbly um, amidst their problems and pain. Walk with God, walk with Jesus amidst suffering in innumerable kinds of circumstances, becoming more devoted to Christ and his kingdom each day, becoming more devoted to the furtherance of the gospel each day. But that was Jesus' mission. That's what Paul's mission became. That was Peter's mission. It's not just the removal of pain from around them, not to feel great, not to succeed at what they wanted to succeed at, but to further the gospel, to further the Great Commission, to see men and women redeemed, to glorify Jesus. The scripture is not a catalog of answers to what do you do if types of questions, because many people will want to use it that way, like you would a dictionary or like you would an encyclopedia, that people will come to you and, and say, okay, here's my problem. What is the fix it? While at certain times uh, the Word of God does provide specific answers, does provide specific solutions to uh, troubles and difficulties of life, that is not all that the Bible is. That is not all that the Word of God is interested in providing. The Scriptures and the Spirit of God work at a much more fundamental, comprehensive, pervasive root level than that. A great example of this is in 1 Timothy 6.10, where, where, Timothy, or where Paul says this to Timothy. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Many who seek counsel from all walks of life, all cultures, all ages, have suffered from the evil Paul would call griefs, beset those who love money. We spend countless hours describing, defining the all sorts of evil, describing and cataloging the many griefs that bifurcate this kind of love. We could then spend countless hours defining the remedies for all these little individual griefs, all these individual evils, humanly speaking. But praise God and Thankfully, the way he has written to us his word, the Spirit has given us that all those hours of listing and categorizing is superfluous. It's above and beyond. Because the fundamental solution to the many evils, to all the griefs, has already been provided in the scriptures by a singular instruction. The solution, no matter how much investigation precedes it, is simple and singular. Do not love money. Do not love money. That yes, there's so many men that I've counseled over the years. The source of their, the ultimate source of their depression is their proud love for money. And then when all of it has been stripped away, when all the retirement is gone, when their job is lost, they go into pits of despair and self-pity and agony and anger because they love money. So we could spend hours trying to define and describe and understand all these little bits and pieces of problems and struggles and the many griefs and the many sorrows. But the good news of the gospel is the solution is singular. It's Jesus. It's the gospel itself. It's don't love money, love Christ. Don't love sex, love Jesus. Enjoy money, enjoy sex as a gift of God, but with an open hand that it can come and it can go, but that your love for Christ is what dominates you. Because, in fact, the, the solution even do not love money, Paul is simply addressing another kind of deviation from the most fundamental of all instructions that we've been given from Deuteronomy 6. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Deuteronomy 6, 5. So the love of money or power or sex or fame or health, or perfect kids, or social value, or whatever else, 
are variations of this same theme. They're variations, they're departures of a human heart from the singular solution, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That that's the level at which the Bible speaks, that very often the Bible speaks in detailed ways. Very often we're given encyclopedic type answers to problems and questions. But more than anything, we're given a whole ambition of life, a whole focus of the heart, a passion of the heart, a desire for Christ and his kingdom that itself remedies the thousands upon thousands of many griefs and evils that beset those who love money and love themselves and don't love God. So why is the Bible not a couple verses in length, I think is a question. And if it's that simple, why is the Bible not just those two verses, those few verses? Um, and I think there's a lot of answers to that question. I'll give you a few. One is because while it's very simple, it's very hard. While it's very simple that all the law and the prophets are founded on those two commandments, love God, love others, it's so hard to do because our heart would rather love hundreds and thousands of other things. And so the Lord has chosen to communicate us in, in numerous ways, in numerous contexts across many situations and characters and themes and principles in styles of writing, in, in histories of time and cultures and spaces to, to find all these different ways for him to minister the message of Jesus, to deliver the gospel to our hearts and what it means to love God and love others. So much of biblical counseling is over time taking the scriptures and just helping people plunge into it, helping people sift their hearts in the word of God. But firstly, over time, identifying the biblical texts that speak relevantly to their heart and to their circumstance. Because there'll be specific texts that really matter if you're dealing with someone struggling with despair and depression. The, the, the Psalm 42, 43, Psalm 73, Psalm 77, um, the whole book of Jonah. There's so many passages of the scripture that speak to that particular struggle. If it's anxiety, there's uh, Matthew 6, and there's Luke 9, and there's Philippians 4, and 1 Peter 5, and uh, uh, Psalm 11, and Psalm 14, Psalm 23. There's just passage upon passage, book upon book, uh, verse upon verse that does speak relevantly to the entire range of human struggles and the entire range of human experiences in one way or the other. But then secondly, over time, help counselors see and comprehend the place of true repentance and humility in the midst of their suffering. That ultimately, no matter what, we're called to live repentantly and humbly before God in the midst of suffering, in the midst of bliss, in the midst of pain, in the midst of joy and delight. That repentance is not merely just an event. It's a whole road we walk. That humility is not just an event. It's a road we walk with God and with our fellow man. That as we pour into the scriptures, as we identify the prides and the lusts and the fears that are in our lives from the discerning the problem phase, we begin to see how the Word of God begins to cleanse those and change those and put to death those and replace them with newer, higher, grander hopes and glories and prayers and desires. And so we help counselors see that humility and repentance is to be our posture in suffering. Over time, we help counselors identify what it means to walk according to the counsel and the glory of God as revealed to us by his word and then commit to those initial steps, to those initial directions. That over time, we help counselors identify what does it really mean to walk according to the counsel and glory of God in the midst of their circumstances, in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their celebration, in the midst of their successes and their labors that we encourage and counsel those, what does it mean to walk with Jesus, to walk in relationship with God, to walk in relationship with our fellow believers, with unbelievers in the midst of all this? And that that's part of what it means to identify biblical solutions. What does the scripture say 
broadly, specifically? What kind of heart are we to take to that process? And what does it mean to really begin to walk with Jesus in the midst of it? So general method four, then, is now we exhort biblical endeavor. That once the fundamental solutions have been identified, once some of the basic solutions and initial steps have been identified, whether that be humility, consideration of God's word, action upon scriptural truths and principles now becomes that next step that we exhort biblical endeavor that now we encourage and call and spur on people to do what they know the scripture has revealed to them to do so quite often that exhorting this exhorting process i believe can be broken down into the seven essential truths of biblical counsel if you remember that we looked at those in chapter three just the seven essential truths a biblical counsel, the things we herald, the things that are compose our creed, the things that we call people to be and to do um, uh, in our counseling, that this is the way we can break out this exhort biblical endeavor. And so it'll begin with forsaking allegiance to the flesh, that we always come back to, with people to our own futility, our own hopelessness apart from God, our own need for God. Uh, our own misery being the result of our own miserable estate, that our own evil being the greatest um, harm that we'll ever do in our own life, our own pride, our own selfishness, our own self-obsession, our own fears and lusts and cravings, all of our attempts to control our world, that they're all futile. All those things are futile. So we always have to come back to that truth and principle those we counsel as we exhort biblical endeavor you've got to forsake the flesh you can't do this by grit and by muscle you can't do this uh, by self-righteous deeds and works of the flesh but it, but you're going to have to resign and submit yourself and surrender yourself to the lord and then secondly trust in the power of god this is what has to follow the acknowledgement of our futility that we strengthen views of God's sovereignty, that we strengthen the idea that God is loving and good and provident over everything in our life, that we encourage the belief that God has given us adequate resources to live life triumphantly and abundantly before him and one another, that the Spirit of God and the Word of God and the Gospels, we'll look at in a little bit, are sufficient graces and resources so you can trust the power of God, that the work he's begun in you he will complete it. And then thirdly, we will dwell upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. That constantly as we exhort biblical endeavor, we're speaking of Jesus. We're speaking of his crucifixion and his resurrection and the implications of that in our lives. We're speaking about the, the state and the standing of the counselee as a redeemed saint. That they are a new creation in Christ and what that means. What that means to live out being a new creation. What that means to be uh, a work in, prog in, in progress, that the Spirit is changing them, and, and what the gospel has to say to them about heaven, about hope, about joy, about peace, that just the message of Jesus is what we're constantly exhorting in and calling people to. That fourthly, we meditate upon, memorize, and apply the Word of God, that in our counseling, the Scripture is ever upon our lap, and we exhort people to, to live with the Bible before them. We encourage those we counsel to rise early and to be in the scriptures, not as some academic, scholarly exercise to check off a box, but because we believe that it truly changes us, that the word of God, when put into the heart, changes us, that when scripture is absorbed into the humble heart, I mean, we become radically different people over time. And to, to know that and to believe that. And as we carry it around with us in our life, as we meditate on it and dwell on it, it becomes a light to our feet, a lamp to our path. So we encourage us, we counsel to always be in, in the scriptures, meditating on the scriptures, memorizing verses of the scripture. There'll be men and women, and I'll just encourage them to, to memorize whole psalms of the Bible because of where they're at, psalms that speak to their particular heart and life. And just to commit those things to memory because it changes us, it sanctifies us, it gives us wisdom for living. Fifthly, we seek power and comfort from the Holy Spirit. 
that we exhort people to walk in the Spirit, to trust God, to obey God, to trust His Word, to walk in His Word, to not lean on their own understanding, to not lean on their own grit, on their own strength and ability, but as we roll out of the bed each morning, we roll to our knees in prayer. We call out to Him for help. We plead with Him for mercy and aid, knowing that the Spirit will comfort us in our affliction, knowing the Spirit will intercede for us in our prayers. And so we exhort the this, this seeking of the power and comfort from the Holy Spirit and not the devices of the world that, again, are futile. But sixthly, we exhort people to engage fully in the body of Christ, certainly to receive, to be encouraged, to be edified by the, by the body of Christ, but more than anything, to learn to love, to learn to pour themselves out to learn to think about others, to minister to others, to get outside themselves and engage fully in the body of Christ, to learn to receive correction and admonishment and rebuke, to learn to deal with conflict according to the word of God and the gospel, to learn to love others. That's such an important part of exhorting biblical endeavor. It's exhorting submission to the body of Christ, a submission to Jesus and his word and his appointed elders and pastors and leaders to engage, to, to encourage and to engage in the ministry of the church and the body of Christ. Because none of us can survive outside it, let alone grow in to godliness. And then seventhly, we wait patiently upon the Lord in his timing. And this is so hard as we exhort biblical endeavor, we exhort patience. We exhort people to remember that sanctification takes time, that change takes time, that sanctification is inevitable for the believer. It will happen, but it will happen according to God the Father's appointed timeline. It'll happen in his way, in his style for you, according to his plan and purposes for you in a way that best glorifies himself and for our good. So we have to learn to wait patiently upon the Lord in this timing that he may not take the pain away anytime soon. As Peter said in 1 Peter 5, that after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace himself will restore you and make you firm, strong, and steadfast. That that little while Peter's speaking of is our natural life. That that little while of suffering may only end upon our death. So there has to be a willingness to wait upon the Lord, to wait upon him to work wonders in our hearts, to change us over time. So those are the four general biblical counseling methods, to love as Christ would love, to discern as Christ would discern, to identify biblical solutions, to exhort biblical endeavor. And there'll be a little chart on your page in front of you where you see those just going around in a circle around the topic of counsel that there'll be some topic of counsel that they bring to you, and who knows what that will be that you'll face with people. But that loving, discerning, identifying, exhorting, that whether over the course of 15 minutes or 15 hours, 15 days, 15 years, we're always about those general methods. We're never done with them. That all counselors, all places, with all people, under all circumstances, can, can bank on those four things and can continually do them. So the acronym is LDI. Love, discern, identify, exhort, and, and may the Lord be with and bless our counsel.